So we'll start with uh, our brief jump off point, which is um, capitalist realism, of course, Mark Fisher. Um, so as we know, Fisher is talking about the, the pervasivity of capitalism, um, that it's seeped into all pockets of life and experience, um, fundamentally altering how reality is. Um, he talks about things like the business ontology, which is structuring everything from healthcare systems to education, um, and also everything else is run as if in a business ontology. And he generally has a kind of um, depressive taste, take where he thinks that we're in a state of exhaustion, uh, much more so than um, what Jameson and, uh, had referred to of the postmodern condition some time ago. Um, so he does say, though, that capitalist realism can only be threatened if it is shown to be in some way inconsistent or untenable, if that is to say capitalism, capitalism's ostensible realism turns out to be nothing of the sort. So we're going to um, think about that possibility. So kind of coming into these theories that I guess um, myself had not thought of maybe in the same way, uh, we're going to kind of go on this capitalist scene model as kind of expanding maybe some of Fisher's thinking in the sense that um, Fisher is kind of, for, to my understanding, Fisher is kind of talking about uh, an entanglement that is really quite inescapable of capitalism. And the capitalist scene, to me, kind of described a space where capitalism was not only entangled, but also a part of the web that we're existing within. Um, and so this kind of uh, puts capitalism within our kind of planet, within nature, and asks us um, kind of how uh, the overlapping philosophical, political, economic, and world historical registers, we might begin to identify 21st century capitalism spaces of vulnerability and contradiction, spaces co-produced through the web of life. Um, Shall I? Yeah, so this, this theory fundamentally says that there's no difference. We, we shouldn't think of there as a difference between nature and humans. Um, so it's kind of opposed to the anthropocentic perspective. Um, which is establishing a conventional logic and description that separates humanity from the web of life. So with the capitalist scene, we're thinking um, really of humanity, capitalism, and other living organisms, even non-humans, as all entangled and uh, meshed together. Something which we don't really see Fisher doing uh, explicitly in capitalist realism. Yeah, that brings me to the kind of sorcery element of this, and I really like Isabel Sanger's um kind of theory that, well, kind of bouncing off Latour since they, woke, they worked quite, uh, together quite a bit. Like God, capitalism does not exist. Or as Isabel Stangers kind of points out to us that um, in this kind of idea of, of uh, theories that we as people create, it is also something that we are maybe wearing as a lens in order to make our, well, in order to add like a spell is, is in seeping into the ways that we look at reality. Um, and then Isabel Sanger is on the contrary, uh, is looking to make sense of how particular modes of existence come undone under the pressure of normative forces or in turn express forms of resistance that open up the space for persistence and becoming. And that leads us to multi-species storytelling. Yeah, so this kind of, um, it, it allows for more of an entanglement, uh, as we were saying, between the, the natural world, between non-humans uh, and humanity. Um, so uh, we, we've kind of been looking at this idea of multi-species storytelling, which is allowing for um, also to hear essentially the perspectives of how other species um, you know, say things and uh, the lens of other objects and non-humans. Um, so it, uh, Anna Tsing in her book, uh, The Mushroom at the End of the World, um, presents an interesting entanglement between the uh, environments of um, forests and where mushrooms grow, um, the networks that those form and how that's entangled with capitalist consumer networks, how um, capitalism both uh, feeds um, mushroom growth and how um, mushrooms aren't necessarily working as capitalist beings on their own, but they are being in, in uh, they are bouncing off of and in necessarily involved with capitalism. Um, yes, the which is the assemblage. Um, so this is. Uh, this is a way of thinking about how um, things can all co-mix and influence each other. Um, so she has this nice example that she starts with. She says, the question of how the varied species in a, spe a species assemblage influence each other, if at all, is never settled. Some thwart or eat each other. Others work together to make life possible. Still others just happen to find themselves in the same place. Assemblages are open-ended gatherings. They allow us to ask about communal effects without assuming them. They show us potential histories in the making. Um, so 
we, we want to look at uh, other practices, the ones we're involved in, uh, as through these other histories that conform with um, non-humans in assemblage. Um, and this, this leads to the concept of precarity that all, Singh's also talking about. Um, and this is where we're thinking about the in, how indeterminate uh, occurrences can influence um, how, we, how we behave, what we do, the practices uh, that we encounter, um, and how we, can, we fundamentally live in a state of flux and precarity. Um, so she says, the precarity, it, precarity is the condition of being vulnerable to others. Unpredictable encounters transform us. We are not in control even of ourselves. Unable to rely on a stable structure of community, we are thrown into shifting assemblages with remake us as well as our others. Great. So we're going to jump into some case studies. Um, so I'm talking a bit about post-instrumental practice, something that I'm a practitioner of. Uh, and then Keith is going to talk about improvisers uh, and networks of improvisers in their practice over time. Um, so post-instrumental practice is um, essentially a group of practitioners distributed quite internationally who work with um, junk. They repurpose found objects. Um, and sometimes purchase items towards musical purposes. Um, so they might take things like uh, a fork that we got at, um, at our, uh, over lunch period and turn this into a musical instrument rather than playing, say, a viola. So, I mean, some of the techniques that come out from a fork um, will interestingly intermingle in this network of uh, practitioners. The, the finding of how a fork um, has knowledge comes from, arises from the object itself um, and is also distributed in a network that also encompasses uh, capitalism's consumer supply chains. Um, and again, if we're thinking about assemblages and entanglement, we can think about how this practice is very much entangled with capitalism, um, with objects that maybe don't that have certain uh, functions uh, within capitalism for you know, selling and uh, markets, um, but also the, the objects on their own maybe having other purposes um, that come into being. Okay, so let's talk about these objects a bit and how they enter into the practitioner's um, uh, work cycle. Um, so one thing is the finding of the object. Um, so these objects are often distributed around in spaces. Um, they're already probably for some purpose. This fork was used for eating. But through a simple playfulness with an object, practitioners take it into the practice. So maybe this fork has a great sound of. Which in experimental music is beautiful. So uh, this, <laughs> this enters into a practice and, ex and an exchange network of people using forks and seeing, oh, look, what's that fork that makes the best sound? Well, it's a wooden one that I got from you know, this specific conference. So now you all want to now play a fork in your next composition. Um, so this, this, this you, you, you might have thrown out your fork, so you have to go to Sam and ask him, where did you buy that fork from? Well, now he says, well, I bought it from the specific Amazon website uh, where they have this specific model of fork which makes the best sound of all forks. Um, so you now will go and purchase those objects and now go back to capitalism to take these objects into, uh, into your own practice. And this will, of course, permeate through the network. Yeah. Um, so this is this is this happening, um, and this happens. So if we think about um, the the objects as um, um, contributing to many uh, different niches. So in, in a way, post instrumental practice is formed by capitalist um, supply chains and networks. However, there's not really much give back from post instrumental practitioners to capitalism. I mean, they're buying these things in fairly small quantities um, compared to you know, the massive uh, monopolies that um, sell goods. Um, but if you think about lots of networks that are all taking things for their own uses, um, then there is uh, an accumulation of possibility. Um, uh, and there, there is kind of a back and forth. And an existence of capitalism is fundamentally built on a bunch of existences of small niches. Um, so let's quickly look at a few examples of this. So I use the fork example, but this is quite a common across um, networks of practitioners. So you see on, I don't know if you can see the mouse, maybe not. So you see this, this tube here, <coughs> plastic tube. Um, so this was used in a performance. I mean, this is typically probably a plumber's utility item. 
uh, but in this piece it was you know waved, waved around and makes funny uh, whirring sounds. So the composer found, must have found a tube, thought it sounded great, and then he bought 20 of them to, for his uh, for performers to use. Another example is um, I have a piece by Yuran Zhao called Sh1, uh, which uses earplugs and nylon gloves. Um, and I had communication with her, uh, she lives in Germany, and she said, these specific gloves are the best gloves. Here is the link on Amazon to go buy those gloves. So it also, you know, the, the internet uh, and um, um, distribution networks allow for this to go across um, countries. Again, we also have Michael Meyerhoff, who has nylon strings, sponges, etc. And then Keith and I in a um, um, performance with bowls and vibrators. So we'll just watch a quick bit of that, and then we'll go to uh, Keith's talk. Okay. So oh, we're going to jump ahead because uh, it's, it's, it's better. too far into that. But as you can see, uh, these vibrators um, and also these like metal salad bowls are being repurposed for making weird music. Um, so in a way, though the, the capitalist monopolies are um, feeding into percussion, post-percussion, uh, post-instrumental practitioners, um, these items aren't being used in the original intended ways that the, the manufacturers are um, suggesting them. So in a way, there's kind of a, a, a reformatting and a creation of a new uh, practice, which I think is uh, more playful and actually quite more positive than the depressive reality Fisher outlines. So let's uh, jump into improv. So um, to kind of start off the free improvisation uh, talk, which does encompass some free improvising practitioners, are post-percussion, uh, post-instrumental post practitioners themselves. Um, and I'm going to use Georgina Bourne, um, who's a very awesome sociologist, in kind of considering the uh, planes of social mediation that exist within free improvisation. And so these are the four planes that I have up here. Now, you don't have to completely understand them. I don't think I do. But I'm using them as a way to kind of organize the, the onslaught I'm about to throw at you of free improvisation history. So we have the diverse socialities, which um, exist across all musical spheres, but specifically within free improvisation. Um, imagined communities, which is usually their audiences, and in fact, the identities that these audiences form around their diverse socialities. The refraction of the larger kind of social areas that are being highlighted within the performances, and the uh, eventual entanglement with a larger institutional um, kind of uh, structures, as Georgina says, um, market or non-market exchange, public and subsidized cultural institutions, or late capitalism, multipolar cultural economy. So now I'm going to go out of this and show you a rather onslaught of the history. So we're starting in the 1960s, 1970s, and in these four planes, I'm going to start putting in big kind of moments um, that we remember in terms of free improvisation history that I think show a nice uh, trans transitioning of the field itself. Um, so we have ensembles that are coming in, the kind of uh, political and um, audience identities that are coming out of it. I'm going to throw these up on the screen really quickly. And if you have questions at the end, this would be um, kind of a, an interesting one maybe to go into further, as I have a lot more to say about all of these, but I can't go into them right now. Um, so. For me, I'm seeing a big entanglement in the kind of 1960s and 70s with a lot of the um, ensembles that are coming in between the refraction, which uh, um, in the 1960s and 70s as a kind of an anarchic style of music production being inherently political and therefore the imagined communities also being inherently political. Um, and talking about kind of what Colin's talking about with the post-instrumental practice, the feminist improvising group, although representing you know, feminist um, ideology and their, um, I their identities of their audiences being largely feminist and queer, they're also bringing in objects onto stage like vacuum cleaners, knives and forks, and typical kind of sexist items and using them within performance. So there's already this kind of social comment that's being imbued with the kind of post-instrumental practice that they're, that they're doing. 
Um, and now I'm gonna take away some of the ensembles that fall away, although some of them stay, um, and add in some new ensembles that come, that are more prevalent in the 1990s than that. Um, 20,000s, we call that bad. Uh, Noisebringers is up there, and if you want to see some free improvisation, we'll have a Noisebringers concert tomorrow evening after the conference is over. Um, and I'm gonna take away some of the refractions that actually become a little bit less important in current free improvisation practice, um, and throw in there the kind of newer, I guess, hot topic um, things, as well as something that I think is, is quite interesting. So Musicians Without Borders, um, although it's a refraction uh, of a political movement, uh, well, not a political movement, but a kind of political thinking right now where we're thinking about, well, who, well, what are our borders? Where, where are we going to be? How are we going to be deciding what we do about, you know, the migration that is going to continue to take over our planet? Bitches Brew is a free improv series that runs in Ireland, Scotland, and Canada, run by Emma Smith. And although she is not necessarily um, talking about the migration within this improv series, which is actually just for women in improv, for highlighting women in improv. She herself works for um, <coughs> Musicians Without Borders, and so I like that um, the kind of uh, political aspect to free improvisation has become maybe less aligned with the way that we're presenting the work, but also now in just the way that we're living our lives as free improvisers on a, on a whole. Um, there are new imagined communities that uh, are, come in as a response to the kind of change in some of the thinking we're having. Uh, in free improvisation is being used a lot within kind of music therapy, well-being, it builds confidence. Um, there's the idea that everyone is an improviser and so the audiences that go to free improvisation are usually also free improvisers themselves. And we have the new aspects of kind of codes and te te technology and internet. Um, and then within this, I actually think that the entanglement within the institutional bodies has moved away from maybe the political realms and moved now towards kind of funding bodies, gig economy, um, and the inherent you know, um, entanglement with PhDs in improvisation, which is what I'm doing. Um, and so I see that there's a shift kind of in the entanglement between now, instead of the politics, now towards the ensembles themselves and the institutions. Um, okay. So, coming back to this, this is like a really big onslaught, and I think it's interesting to think about the social kind of relationships that are quite coincidental in terms of the way that they have arisen, and kind of a lot of the way that George, I think, was talking about, although maybe some of it went over my head. This is kind of like specific examples of where these wide webs of interaction are happening, how they're changing, and actually how that entanglement is really not something that we can necessarily put our finger on, and also that it is a lot of the time very coincidental to the time that it is taking place, although there is bleed over from the different evolutions of these entanglements. Um, and I, so I bring this up, not that I have an answer for you as to how that entanglement with uh, a lot of what would be the negatives to the entanglement would be with capitalism, but I think that um, inherently that entanglement is constantly um, fluxing, and therefore it is kind of hard for capitalism to inherit, to in some way say that it has a stronghold in any particular way on the free improvisation community, which I'm sure it doesn't care much about. Okay. Should we do conclusion? Conclusion. Oh, no, oh, no there are no examples. I, I will, you can just ask for these after if you want. Um, I had a kind of cheeky question I kind of wanted to pose to you guys. Um, and I don't necessarily think I have an answer, but it struck me that uh, Ayn Rand is kind of talking in the 1950s about uh, a society which is losing its kind of creativity and its you know, experimental uh, thinkers and minds. And she says, sees this as a lack of capitalism. And then reading the Mark Fisher, I was thinking like, well, he's kind of saying very similar things except on the complete other side of it. So I just wondered if you guys had some maybe interesting things to say about maybe this anxiety of the loss of, of um, experimentation with, with our, I don't know, with, the, with our, our current society. Um, and then ask possibly maybe um, whether some of the answers uh, do exist in maybe some of these larger assemblages that are beyond maybe the, the human specific kind of focus. Yeah, so essentially how to think about you know, capitalist realism as maybe there's lots of pervasivity of capitalism in many things, and it does come into contact with other non-humans such as the mushrooms or the objects. Um, but how also those things operate on, and, and on their own scale. They, they have other um, interests in mind. Um, and to think of uh, entanglements with, um, with the world as a change of perspective um, from an all-pervasive capitalism to uh, allow for um, a, an alternative future that's more hopeful. 
So do you want to read the last Sing uh, quote? So <coughs> which one you want? Yeah, I don't know. Which one, whichever. Well, if I have added to the conversation, it is in drawing <coughs> attention to livelihoods that are simultaneously inside and outside of capitalism. Rather than focus our attention only on the capitalist imagery with its displaced workers and savvy managers, I have tried to show precarious living in scenes that both use and refuse capitalist government governance. Such assemblances tell us what's left despite capitalist damage. 